Dear friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Indian Soap World Culture for this uh, evening's lecture on the subject Symposium on Love. Symposium on Love, which is one of the dialogues of Plato which are being delivered, lecture on which are being delivered by Shri 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 Tike Jairam. Now, I, on behalf of the World Culture and on behalf of all of you, I extend a hearty welcome to Shri Tike Jairam. She, T.K. Jairavan, need no introduction. Yet, for the benefit of those who might have come for the first time or who have not attended the previous lecture, I will make a brief mention of his background. He is basically an electrical engineer. After doing his electrical engineering graduation, he joined the Indian Revenue Service and served in various capacities as revenue, Indian Revenue Service officer in uh, different parts of India. Towards the end of his career, he served in the Customs, Excise and Service Tax Appellate Tribunal and he retired in that capacity, he retired in 2009. Till then, after his retirement, he has been devoting his life to the exploration of ideas. Though a technocrat and a bureaucrat, his passion is for exploration of ideas. And he has studied various philosophies of the world, both Western and the Eastern. He is devoted to uh, Western philosophical studies. And he is very enthusiastic in sharing ideas, the fruits of his studies, with people. He takes great pleasure in sharing his ideas with the public. And he takes great pain in this self-assumed labor of love. So, the Indian of World Culture has been very fortunate to have him deliver a long series of lectures on Western philosophy. The series began way back in 2015, September 2015, with a talk on Emmanuel Kant and his philosophy. And in the subsequent talks in the series, he covered almost the whole gamut of the modern Western philosophy to thought up to 2019, up to April 2019. And then he began sometime in April 2019, he began with ancient Greek philosophy, beginning with philosophy of Stoicism, Epicurean, Epicureanism, and then uh, an overview of Platonic philosophy covered various uh, dialogues like Apology, Fido, Euthyphro, Chimides, Chimides, and so on and so forth. Today we are having the dialogue on Symposium on Love. So, with this brief introduction, I request Sri Jainavan to tell me this talk. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ram Prakash, for your kind introduction. I thank the Secretary of the IIWC also for giving me this opportunity to give my talk on Plato's dialects. Uh, 
uh, the name of the dialogue is symposium i don't want to tell you much about plato except in that he was one of the most brilliant philosophers of the western world and he is known for his exposition of philosophy through dialogues with that i would straight away go to the subject matter so that i can devote more for the content of the dialogue the name of the dialogue you will find a difference in most of the dialogues uh, uh, the name will be the name of some person who is taking part in the dialogue but here the name of the dialogue is symposium we are familiar with the word symposium in modern days you know there will be a symposium on a particular subject on an issue of scholars will be taking, uh, taking part in this symposiums but in the ancient greek culture know that symposium itself means a party generally a drinking party in the greek culture so they have you know and it is ma mainly the affair of males gentlemen it's uh, not family gathering or anything it's all the you know males will gather they will have uh, drink they will have dinner and all that but it's not simply uh, you know drinking and uh, then uh, merry making it also includes some talks see serious not always frivolous you know? normally you find in drinking parties you know they will talk all sorts of jokes and all that uh, you know it will be like that even in uh, modern days but then this symposium normally takes some serious subjects also and everybody will be talking it is mainly a conversation that's what so that culture was very much prevalent in the ancient greece so that uh, we have to be very aware uh, second you know now we will come to this particular dialogue this dialogue this symposium is in a uh, uh, plato's dialogues this is taking place in the house of a great writer of tragedy agathon there is also an occasion for this uh, symposium normally it's not just they will gather some occasion here he is celebrating his winning of first prize in writing of his first tragedy that's what he is so he is going to celebrate it so he is inviting a lot of people and they will be having this dinner party party drinking talking and all this stuff so in this particular dialogue so we should know who are all the participants so the participants as you know in any of these dialogues socrates is one of the main participants so he is one of the main participants apart from socrates there are others so i will give you a very brief introduction to them one is you know agathon which i said agathon was a writer you know tragedy writer and he is celebrating is victory you know it means prize you know he won some prize and then he is celebrating it. that's why he is having this party then there is another person aristophanes he is a very great name in ancient year writer of comic poetry and he also wrote a, a, a comic a poem known as clouds where he satirizes socrates is making all fun of socrates in that cloud it's very famous so aristophanes is there then you have a person alkibiades alkibiades is a young man a very handsome man and he also you know uh, he did some foolish things like uh, uh, the, you know unnecessarily because of him uh, they, they invaded sicily and they were defeated and not only that for sometimes he collaborated with sparta so there are certain problems with him but he is very fond of socrates that you have to understand you know he was very fond of socrates and at this point i would like to tell you a particular custom in the ancient greece you know this custom see today we, we may not like it you know there is an english word called pederasty you know? pederasty so the culture of pederasty was there in the ancient greece so which i have to tell what is it 
there, you know, suppose there is a young boy, you know, young persons, you know, and there are old people. So, normally these old people means much more, not very, very old, older than these uh, fellows, they will take these young boys as lovers. That custom was very much different. It's what for? You know? It is, they are like mentors. You know, they will teach them. They will teach them do this, that and all that, you know. They will train them in wisdom, virtues also. So that means, of course, the physical gratification is not good. So, which we have to be very clear. And that was the custom in the ancient days. So, you will find it very strange. They will say, so and so is the lover of so and so. And both will be males. So, this is also, there is an English word called, it's called homoeroticism. So, the homoeroticism was very much prevalent in the ancient days. So, why I have to tell you now is Alkibayades was a lover of Socrates. You know, he, he was very much attached to Socrates. He is also coming in the dialogue at the end, but his speech is not that important. Then, you have uh, you know, there is a doctor here in this dialogue. He is Eryximachus. He was a doctor, you know, a very learned man. He is taking, uh, is, uh, taking part in this dialogue. Then there is another person, Pausanias. This Pausanias is actually, again, he is a lifelong lover of Agathon. Agathon who is celebrating, you know, his victory. And Agathon also is a very handsome fellow. So, this relationship is there and it is indicated. Then there is another person known as Phaedrus. He is also a very handsome young fellow. He is an admirer of Socrates. Okay. Then there is, there, are other, um, there is another person who was a guest, Aristodemus. He is not talking. Then, uh, then there is another person, Apollodorus. He is not in the dialogue. He is only narrating this entire dialogue to another person, unknown person. See that. And how does this Apollodorus know this dialogue? He heard it from Aristodemus. You know, that's all. So there are many layers to it. Don't worry about all that. What we are interested in is only in what is happening in the dialogue. What is it they are going to discuss? What is so important about it? So all the other things you can forget. Now you can only concentrate on what is this dialogue. So, this Socrates, you know, he is coming late master. He comes very late for the dinner. By the time he comes, you know, others are already off, the dinner is over, but he comes and participates. So, once the dinner is over, then they all said, let's drink. Socrates won't drink. He says, I don't want to. Then the doctor who is in the party, he says, my boys don't drink too much. It's all bad for health. He says, so limit your drinking. So Phaedrus was telling me, so at that time he introduces the The doctor, Eric Simancus, introduces the doctor. Phaedrus was telling me that day that all these poets are singing praise of all the gods and all that. But one thing, nobody is bothered about love. So, why can't we have this occasion, this party, to, yes, this occasion for people to make speeches in praise of love. So that was the topic. Remember. So that means there are totally six people are going to talk. Remember. Not all the people who might name, they are not going to talk. So six people are going to talk. So, the topic given is in praise of love. So, what is this love and why, how it is praised and all that, all the entire gamut, you know, of uh, uh, this love, love, love. You know, love is a very commonly used term in every language. So, let us, you know, have an insight into what this dialogue 
teaches us. So now it will be very easy for you to follow because I will name the person and I will give you the essence of his speech, what he tells about love. So one, two, three, four, all, and at the end it is the turn of Socrates, and that is the highlight of this dialogue. You know what Socrates is going to, how he is going to present this. That is the best part of this dialogue. It doesn't mean others they simply talk the nonsense or something. Not at all. Everybody tells his own point of view. And in all these dialects, we have to remember that, see, truth is there everywhere. You know? Truth has got different dimensions. So you have to appreciate whoever tells something about a particular subject. You have some truth. It may not be the whole truth. So that is, that is the benefit of Plato's dialects. In all Plato's dialects, there are different characters. It's not that Socrates has said the truth and all the others spoke all some nonsense. No, it's not like that. It is that different people, you know, how they look at life, how they look at issues, that is important. So, they are expressing their views and these views are being examined and they either don't come to a conclusion or they come to some conclusion. So, that, that is the thing. And this dialogue is really a very beautiful and fruitful dialogue for all of us. And remember the theme of love, it is a universal theme. It's a universal theme. Irrespective of the culture, you know, where you belong to, you know, love is something universal. And it has different, different, different meanings. You know. It's not just one meaning. Oh, you cannot define love in one or two sentences say and that is the end of it. So we have to discuss what exactly it is. So with this introduction, we will go to the dialogue part, speech part of the dialogue. So who is going to give the first speech? You know, because Pedras only suggested that these poets are not talking much about the love God. So they said, Pedras, you have to begin the speech. You give your speech. And so, again, in praise of, how are you going to praise uh, love? Remember that in all the cultures, most of the cultures, even in Indian culture, you know, all these abstract qualities, you know, we have gods. We, for everything, there is a god. Even love in Indian Culture knows how God is there. You know? Of course, different different names are there, you know, depending upon what exactly what is the implication. So you have a, a, you know Manmata or Kama and all that in Indian culture. Kama is it is symbolic, it is nothing but your mind. You know, your mind is going after, you know, full of desires. You know, it grows up, you know. You have all your senses. So, very beautifully, you know, desire is described even in Indian culture. How Manmata could even disturb Lord Shiva. So, all these things have got great meanings. We need not take them literally. So, it is the same thing with Greek culture and Greek mythology also. Greek abounds in all myths. Of course, for us, it is sometimes very difficult to follow all their myths because for everything there is some God. Now, coming to Phaedra's speech, what does he say? So, he says that uh, both gods and human beings hmm, regard this love as great and awesome. You know, they regard love. You know. And he says, the love means the god of love. Don't worry about the gender. Sometimes goddess comes, but God comes. Even goddess will be a god. So we will say, he says, the god of love is older than all the other gods and has no parents. This is again going to the Greek mythology. You know, 
they say first every there was only what they call as chaos there was only chaos and afterwards only the earth appeared and love fairest of the gods appeared so this is all coming from the greek mythology so he is taking that point of view and he says before all the other gods were created you know and it was love so love is the oldest form and he tells all in superlative terms about the benefits of love and one of the benefits of love he says when there is love you know this love will not allow us to do any shameful or dishonorable act so he gives examples from the greek mythology he says suppose there is a person and he has a lover you know and he will always appear to be very honorable you know he would not like to go and do some dark deeds in presence of his son so it keeps you on the alert you know you have to be honorable then you have love then you have a lover then so in mythology and history and all we have seen how you know to show their valor you know people have fought and shown their courage and all so it is there in greek mythology also he is giving some examples say for example in india we have this yama and savitri so in greek also there is a story where somebody is to die one lady you know sorry one man admitus he has to die but then he was he was told that if anybody is going to take place take your place you will not die so what happens his wife alcest she was ready to die for him so he is pointing out this see how how daring she is just for the sake of the husband you know she was ready to give up give up her life and the god themselves appreciated and then even though she died and uh, the person came alive she was also raised from the dead because the god appreciated so this is one example so we have the best example of how the savitri you know is pleading with yama so you need not go further so again he says in another case um you know in, in the case of orpheus his wife eurydice uh, died but he did not have the courage uh, you know to take place um, you know uh, to take her place so he only went to hades the nether worlds to meet her so he did not get that privilege you know some misfortune happened to him so he is giving that example then he is giving another example from the iliad where uh, there was a great hero uh you know achilles most of her you know in english language you know the weakest part is called achilles heels you know the achilles again here you see achilles had a great lover you know who was known as patroclus the patroclus was killed so achilles wanted to avenge that so he kills a very great hero called hector all these things come in the iliad magic so see the glory of this just for the love you know he killed that another man so with these examples he says love is the best of the things it offers many benefits that means it leads you into virtue that is the point but the love in fact will not there will not be a downfall you know unfortunately in the english language you know you are always falling in love <laughs> you are not raising in love but love is at the end of the dialogue we will see how you have to raise in life mm-hmm. rising rising going up in love and not falling down so this is the gist of his speech and after his speech next comes you know uh, the uh, turn up one pausanias pausanias is again slightly elderly man lover of agathon agathon who is hosting the party and pausanias now he is alluding to the greek custom and he also tells there are two types of uh, loves you know uh, you also must have heard of this aphrodite aphrodite is the greek goddess of love that also you have to understand aphrodite 
the great god goddess of love there are two three uh, two versions about her birth i don't want to trouble you much with that but depending upon her birth you know she is actually known as the daughter of uranus you know and uranus she was born from home you know uranus was attacked by one of his sons and then uh, probably he castrated him and uh, uh, his testicles fell into the ocean and there was foam and from that apu became a star that is why you know she is called she so she is not born of a woman you know the love that particular the particular type of love poseni says it is heavenly love hmm? heavenly love where you don't have a man woman union that is he calls it heavenly love and there is another love which is common love there also that aphrodite in another religion it is she will be the daughter of zeus and dione so like any other normal uh, child so he classifies the love as heavenly love and common love and he says one love is superior what is that superior love so again you have to go to the greek culture the greek people you know when a young boy becomes friendly with an elderly man for wisdom and virtue knowledge and all they prized it very high than the normal you know people going getting married to a person producing children and all that was the ancient greek so but so alluding to that he says heavenly love is much better and then he says even the person the old man who takes the young boy as a lover and he has to be interested in developing the virtues of the young person and not his self gratification that is very very important if he forgets then it is of no use so always the point in greek culture is that you have to develop and educate you know educate young men in all the virtues the virtues which we always think of courage moderation knowledge you know these are all the virtues which we speak of in all platonic dialogues so that is the thing the young people should be inculcated all values and all so an elder teacher is needed so that he is uh, um, uh, talking in, uh, in praise of that love you know so what is the main purpose of love again he said the main purpose of love is only to instill virtue in the young people okay. so this is all his speech so everybody says love is a god love is a goddess and love is important love confers many benefits so that is the burden of all these speeches so that is the second speech now let us go to the third speech what is the third speech is by the doctor the physician you know he is erixinus actually he is speaking out of the because the third speaker should be aristophanes aristophanes had some problem of hiccups <laughs> he was not immediately able to talk he was suffering from hiccups then this uh, eryximachus gives him some remedies and now you do this you do that and all that and he also says finally you do some sneezing and see that you get it then it will be okay and all that. so it's all in passing you know? that's not important so the, he says okay you talk first i will talk later so instead of aristophanes it is eryximachus who is the doctor who is going now to talk about love now when the doctor comes there the whole perspective changes okay doctor says oh you people were talking about the love the emotional attachment between persons but i am going a little high he says this again he says love pervades everything he says not only human relations love is all the things so as a physician he says even if you take in the body there are so many things taking place inside the body there is heat there is cold and different different humors and all that one will be opposite to that that is what he says is there are antagonistic elements antagonistic elements 
So, but what is healthy? See, certain things are important. You have to love certain things. Maybe, see, you have to love good food. Nutritious food you have to love for your health. But then, you can't love, say, alcoholic drinks. Something intoxicating. So, you should know what to take and what not to take. He says in all these things, he says love is important. What is this love? This love is, you know, keeping harmony, you know, among different, different antagonistic elements. There are antagonistic elements. He gives many other examples, very nice examples. So in the body, so that is the job of the physician. So that, uh, so don't think love is only between persons. So when you keep that harmony by proper means, so that is the operation of love in medicine. So love is there in athletics, you know, in the physical exercise, you know, to shape your body. See, the Greek um, um, valued the beauty of the body very much. When you see the Greek statues and all, you know, men's statues, nice, well proportioned. It will be really very nice to look at because they valued it. The proper body structure, the proportions, you know, all these things are very important. So, athletics, gymnastics, gymnastics. Then, agriculture. How agriculture? There also, you see, the seasons are there. They are all governed by, you know, Planetary motions, they are all responsible. So, love is keeping harmony, keeping these antagonistic elements in place. If that love is, is, is pervading the entire universe, so his uh, theory is really very good. So, he gives a new meaning to love. It's not love is not simply an attachment, no, attachment to a person. So, harmony, what about music? You know, you have got different, different notes. So, there is a harmony and rhythm in the music. All notes will not be, then it will not be music. So, there the musician also, he has to keep that, you know, that uh, harmony, rhythm among the various antagonistic notes and all. So, what is that love? So, again, it is the love of doing something. Doing something. The love is there in arts. You know? So without that love, where is the artist? So it is love. So he gives. So love includes love of seasons. So love is this only. Love makes harmony. So he emphasized that aspect as a decision. So that was appreciated. And that point up, one point up. Then comes the turn of Aristoteles. Aristophanes, as you know, he was a comic poet. So, he and Greek uh, comedies and all would be very vulgar body and all that. You know? you know, see them, they are, they are not very, I mean, you, I won't say them very edifying and all that. But anyhow, you know, let us see how he speaks here. Aristophanes' speech is, he now, this is also a sort of myth only. Probably he created his own story. You know, imagine, very fertile imagination. So what he says is, in the beginning, there were three genders. There were three genders. What are those three genders? He says, male, female, androgynous. Okay. Which is male and female. We have our Ardhana Ishwara. Male and female. He says it was like that. He describes the structure. Not one body, two bodies. So two males will be there. Means there will be having um, four hands, you know, four hands. Two people attached with each other. They can see forward and backward. Okay. And they can move very fast with the strength of two people. And they can roll, spin, and all that. They can do all such things. So, male gender. Similarly, female. Two females attached to each other. No. Females. That is the female gender. Then androgynous will be one male and one female attached. 
to these people the very part he also says the males uh, were born from the sun and the females from the earth and the androgynous from the moon so that's what he says and they had enormous strength because of the structure and they were going to the mount olympia here and there and they were doing all sorts of things and they they were a threat even to the gods so this zeus he wanted to teach them some lesson so he said why don't they they were the gods did not want to destroy completely this gentes the three gentes they say if we destroy all these people they will there won't be any sacrifice for us because there was always the Uh, as in india there was the custom of giving sacrifices to the gods in the greek culture also so they say let's not kill them because we want their sacrifices so what did we do they were all cut into two you know so two men cut into two two women cut into two man woman cut into two. so they all were placed in different places so as a result what happens the one person he becomes very sad because he is not seeing his partner so he is always in search of his partner so the, he has that yearning yearning the desire you know that uh, eagerness you know to go and get his other off every person has an other off so the male when he is from the male gender he is going after the male who was his pet you know who was similarly females one female she will be searching for her pet lost pet so he says the whole of the humanity is like that we are always trying to find that person who will make us whole so love is nothing but the desire the impulsion that hopes you know which around the direction tries to make you whole oh, because now you are only a part so in the same manner the one man and woman who were together earlier now they want to say he wants to find his mate you know that is where they say this origin of these relations was you have that heterosexual relations and you have the homosexual relations so he gives this he but but you know he has to have a very inventive very uh, i mean fertile mind to have invented this so he says this is you know, so everybody is going in some and they feel happy once they find their home and he, after finding them if suppose some god makes them one you know inseparable they will be really very happy that also he says they will be really very happy like that he can put this so the essence of his speech is only this story nothing else okay now three people have uh, yeah four people have spoken spoken so we have got only two more next speech is given by agathon Agathon, the writer of tragedy, who is celebrating this victory, he is giving, he is really giving a very beautiful speech in terms of rhetoric and all that, all using superlatives. So he really gives a very beautiful speech. But what is the content of this speech? No, he is again. It is all in praise. You know, it is, it is in praise of uh, love. How he says. Somebody told, "Love is the oldest god." When you compare to all the other gods, the first speaker he said that he says, "No, no, no, no. I don't agree with that." He says, first of all, he says, "Here, I want to tell the nature of love." Agatha wants to tell the nature of love. He says, first of all, in all their super things, what is the first super? Love is the happiest of. Why? He is the most beautiful. Love is the most beautiful, and he is the best. So he is the youngest. 
and he says he avoids old age. He wants to associate always with young people. So young people and love somehow he connects. And he also says in the initial days these gods, you know, did horrible things to each other. This gods fighting with each other is not peculiar to the Indian mythology. It is that very much much more the, in the Roman and the, in the Greek mythology. So this is gods where there was not harmony between them until the advent of the love god. Then what happened when the love god was there? He says that when the love started ruling the god, the gods became more peaceful. And he makes another point when the ruling rule of love god was there, then even these gods thought of the beautiful. They were in search of the beauty, which is a very important term in Platonian philosophy. Not beauty. So he and he also says, love is a very sensitive. It will remain only with the soft people, not with very hard people. So it, it goes into the heart of the soft people. You know, uh, it settles in their minds and hearts. It will not go to very hardened, uh, you know, people people with tough character and all that. So, that is one of the qualities of uh, uh, love. Then he comes, he next point, like the atheist speaker, he talks about the virtues. He says, when you have love, you are just. Not the justice, the just. Person with love, he will be just. He won't lose force. Love practices moderation. See, these are all the virtues to be moderate. Moderation. Yes. Again, he reiterates the point gods became organized and peaceful because they were motivated by love and the love of beauty. This term is very important because in the subsequent talks, this question of beauty assumes an important role in the philosophy of love. Love and beauty and what is beauty. Okay. So, he gave such a good spe a speech in praise of love, saying love, the final use is the virtue. So when you have a loving heart, this is the virtue parts. All these virtue parts. So, he finished his talking. Now comes the point, final point. So that is going to be Socrates. Now Socrates, again as is usual, his sarcasm is there. He says, my God, this Agathon gave such beautiful speech. I don't know whether I can, uh, I can be equal to him. But what uh, eloquence, you know. See, I don't know this type of thing. All the others also spoke very high of love. So much praise. All people spoke superlative things about love. But you see, I am very hesitant whether I have to continue the talk or do you want me to withdraw? They said, no, 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 don't say like that. They said, you should talk. You talk. Then he says, no, I can't talk like Agathon and others, you know, in uh, such eloquent language. Only I can talk only the truth. <laughs> that is what, that is the sarcasm. That means the others, it's understood. They did not speak so much of truth. Yeah, probably that is the sar uh, sarcasm of uh, sar uh, Socrates. So, then he says, again you see his method. Before talking, you know, Will you all allow me? I'll put some question to this Agathon. <laughs> so this is the problem with Socrates, you know. And so now starts a very interesting part, you know. So Socrates, then yeah, he has to answer. So Agathon, be ready. Socrates is going to shoot you with questions and you have to answer. And then he is going to give his speech. So, Socrates asked him, 
you talk so much love, 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 love. Tell me, love is always love of something. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah, I agree. He gives an example. See, if it is, if it is a father, what is the love, love of? Uh, the, the, the love of his, uh, you know, for a father, the love, love of his son, or the love of his daughter, it, there will always be of something. Okay. You agree? Love of. Yeah. When, when there is a uh, love, it is love of something. So, with a series of questions, yeah, what is so uh, difficult to understand, love is always love of something. So from smaller, smaller things, they say, uh, everybody um, um, loves, uh, you know, beautiful things. Nobody can say he doesn't, uh, you know, love beautiful things. Yeah, love is also of beauty. Yeah, love is of beauty. So love is of beauty. Beauty is goodness. Sure. So love is of goodness. Love is of goodness. Now he takes this statement. Love is of good means you love in search of good. So, love itself is not good. <laughs> love itself is not beautiful. Love is something, no, it's a very nice statement, which goes in search of, it has some folds, you know, which goes in search of beauty, in search of good. Understood? Yeah. Yes, Socrates, that's correct. Because it's what you say is correct. Nobody can disagree with you. So, remember first, you all are talking, love is this God, that God and all that. So, love is, you know, when love is in search of good, you know, it is not good. So, it is lacking something. Okay? When you are lacking in something, you are after. That's very easy to understand. It's not that you are already having it. When you are having something, you just keep quiet. You know, only thing is you should not be deprived from you. So, then uh, he is a little upset. Don't you agree? You know, uh, yes, Socrates, I cannot argue with you more. <laughs> no, no, no. You can argue with Socrates, but you cannot argue with truth. Okay. <laughs> then Socrates comes to the elaboration of this point. That he is introducing another character. You know, we can call it as a fictional character. He tells Agatha, Agatha, don't worry. I was also thinking like you only. But in my younger days, I used to have a teacher, Diotima, the lady. Diotima, an important lady who knew all these chantings, charms and other things, you know, some sort of sage-like uh, figure. So this Diotima taught me all about love. She was my teacher. So I was also thinking like that, love is this, love is that. And all. So Diotima taught me the art of love. What exactly is the significance of love? What is love? What is the meaning of love? All that she So, I will share that with all of you, with you and all the others. So, that is, so our last part will be, well, that will be the last part of this talk, which is what transpired between Diotima and Socrates. What transpired between Diotima and Socrates. Yes. Now, again, just as uh, Socrates was questioning Agatha, Diotima was questioning Socrates, and uh, many, many things, you know, they argue. And what we are interested in, I am not going to take one by one the question and answer, but in the essence of so now it was established, you know, with this thing, love is always lacking something which is in such a That was unveiled. So love is of beauty. So love itself is not beauty. Love is 
in search of good. So love itself is not good. There is quality is that love so that question. So, says, he gives a very good example. Say, if you take a God, you know, because they were all telling love is God. See, if you take a God, the God is already full of wisdom. The God is all full of beauty. The God does not need any of these things. So, God is not it. And when you take an ignorant human being, he doesn't have neither, neither, neither beauty. Now this, so this love is an intermediary. So this love is an intermediary between, it's not God, it's an intermediary between God and human being. It is neither a human being nor God. It is an intermediary. And what is the function of the intermediary? So that intermediary is when human beings we offer prayers and sacrifices and all to the gods, send gifts and all that. So it is through love. So this love is a spirit, he says, you have to understand. Love is a spirit. You know, it itself is not a god, that means it's a sort of force. Impulse you to do something. Then you are after something, so it is the force. It takes you there. It makes you do all the efforts. That is love. So love itself is not some fixed thing. Some uh, so don't call it as a god. Okay. So that point. Then at this juncture, she tells a very small story. Maybe this is also from Greek mythology. So figuring love, you know, even if you consider love as a personality, she gives a small story. See, this is all metaphorical, you know, we have to take them as a metaphor. How love was conceived. She tells a story, in the story, the essence of the story is like that. Love is the child of, you know, plenty. Plenty is rich, richness. Richness and penury. Penury is poverty. So, he says, they were celebrating the birthday of Aphrodite. Again, she is known as a goddess of love. When she was celebrating, when they were celebrating the birthday of uh, Aphrodite, this plenty means rich. She was sleeping in the garden and this penury, poverty was pausing by. Poverty did not have anything. So, she had a desire. So, why can't? Through him, I conceive. So, she goes and sleeps um, with him and conceives, and she conceives this <laughs> That is the story given by. So, that means love itself, you know, it is, its father is plenty, mother is penury. So, there is, it is something in between, you know. So, love is a sort of meal between two extremes, you know, love. That means, love is falling between wisdom and ignorance. Wisdom, the gods are all wise, full of wisdom. Men, you can't say, you know, they are in different stages. So, when there is a search for wisdom, when there is a search for wisdom, that's also love, you know. So, you are going towards the higher, you know, higher scale, and that is love. So, that is why this love is also philosophy. Even the Greek word philosophy is philo, means love. Sophos means wisdom. Love of wisdom. So, love finally is nothing but its ascent. It is an ascent towards wisdom. You go to a better state, you know, from that. And that constantly takes place. And again, see very nicely, you know, differentiates between two things. One is between the love, uh, between the love and the lover. Or, in another word you can say, the beloved and the lover. She says, 
the love has no perfection. Our lover has no perfection. He is after perfection. The beloved is perfect. Beloved is beautiful. Beloved is good. Beloved is all superlative. We are all lovers. We are searching them. We are going after them. So you have to uh, kindly understand the difference between love, hmm, which is you know lover who is in search of love, oh, love, and he is searching the beauty, he is searching the goodness. So differentiate. So that is perfect. But we are not perfect. We are all such. So uh, now. She gives a certain very beautiful metaphysical truths to which I have to come. Then what is this? You know, why people pursue love? You know, why do they pursue love? She gives very nice examples. Love is in, in its pursuit there are different stages. You see, at the lowest level, at the lowest level, you know, there is procreation. There is procreation. So, love's function is to give birth. Giving birth in beauty, both in body and mind. For mind you can put so body and soul. So, the function of love is, you know, giving birth. I think what is the metaphysical idea behind it? You know, in giving birth is related to immortality. So the, finally, it is the immortality. Why, you know, why, why a human being, you know, he is also after immortality, and at a lower level, you know, he marries and he gets his own children. You know, at least after this body dies, there is a succession. She points out this succession is there in everything in the universe. You know, there is constant reproduction. You, you take for example any, see even if you take the human body, they say every day 10 power 11 cells, new cells are generated. Every day in the world. So that means they are replacing the cells which so this sort of procreation generation is there at every level. So the lowest level is matter and it is the physical. But go oh, little higher, this is this procreation doesn't stop with the procreation of animals, kids, children and all that. It's just you have to go the little higher. And when it is of the mind, the poet creates. All the time the poet is creating poetry through so of the mind. The artist, the artist creates, you know. So it is all what impels all these things. It is only the love of the good which is immortal. So if you closely appreciate, you can also be approaching our Indian philosophy. Because in our India, we say, no, finally, if you take Brother and Shepanishad, the dialogue between Yajnavalkya and, uh, I think, this is Maitri or Gargi, I forgot, one of the ladies, you know that, he says, the husband is dear, not because of the husband, he is dear because of the self. Wife is dear, not because of the wife, because of the self. In a, Atma. In India we use the term Atma. So, there is a principle of immortality. You know? That immortality in Platonian philosophy, it is either you call it as a good or beauty. Beautiful. beautiful. So, that beautiful, he says, how to get that beautiful? He says, there are several stages of getting that beautiful or that good. The, those stages are known as uh, ladder, hmm? ladder of love, you know, ladder of love. From this smaller thing, he says, from this 
procreation type of love, you are ascending, you are going to the mental, you know, creative art. And then institutions and laws in the society and family. See, they are also very important. You know? The men who make them the constitution, the laws of the land, the laws of the city, and they are also great because for the organization of the world, all these things are needed. So these are also creation. He says all these things, what is the motive? The final motive is love only. But it doesn't end that. You are going, slowly you are climbing up the ladder. He says, even when you have the physical love, you see, you see one body and you see it beautiful. Later you realize there are many forms of beautiful things. Then afterwards all these beautiful things are changeable. You know, they change. Beautiful things change. But then, ultimately you realize that there is an unchangeable beauty in the form, F O R N capital, F capital, form, which is the Platonician philosophy, form is important, form is an immutable thing and in your philosophic contemplation you can realize that ultimate thing which is immortal, which is beauty and which is goodness or which is, you call it good, so says you have to ascend to it. Don't stop with that and nothing is less important, everything. So there is a stage in the ascent on the ladders of love and that is what the Yodhima told me. So you, you see, even if you take the human being, she says every minute, apart from our physical thing, even our mental makeup also we keep on changing. The young man is not the same as the old man, you know. Even though the identity is there, the self, but the self itself is changing, you know. You are changing, changing, you are evolving, that is what he wants to say. So, this constant change in the universe is also, he says, finally, it is towards the realization of that form. So, that is the ultimate function of love, is realization. So that is the talk. It was everybody understood. They appreciate that. And then the last thing is not important. Still I have to tell you when here Socrates finishes his speech this Algebiades he comes he sees Agathan uh, sitting near uh, uh, you know he garlanded Agathan he sees Socrates on the couch sitting near uh, Agathan so he becomes jealous he again takes back that garden and puts on Socrates' stick and he sits with him and he, everybody says, as Alcibiades, you give a speech. Then he gives a speech in which he praises Socrates like anything. And one thing important is, he tells, which is quite important for everybody, he says, and he tells something nice about Socrates, he says he tried his best to seduce Socrates but Socrates was not seduced. His love is of a different dimension. So he shares his experience with Socrates to all the others and the dialogue ends. And this is what we learn from Plato's symposium. That is why you have a term in English which is called the Platonic love. So the Platonic love has nothing to do Thank you. I complete. Yeah, we have some questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, in Aristotle's uh, contribution mm -hmm. in the symposium. Mm -hmm. There, you uh, he spoke, he speaks of three genders. Three genders. What are the three genders? What is hermaphrodite joined together? Hermaphrodite that he calls it androgynous, and man woman. The other is man. Two men attached. Is it man? I didn't understand. Yeah, well, three two three women three. attached. Two women attached, two men attached? Yeah, with four legs, four hands and all that. No, but what is the third gender? The androgynous. He calls it androgynous. Third gender is called and androgynous. is uh, two. Yeah, but they, they combine. See, the point is, two males combine. 
that he calls male, Aristophanes calls that only as male, and two females are combined in the initial stage, that only he calls female. When male and female are combined, he calls them androgynous. Okay, okay. And uh, other two, before other two, male, male and male, female and female. Yeah, the they are only males, they are only females. The third gender is this mixed. Mixture is the third gender. The, what are the first two called? The first, the first two, <coughs> uh, first one is called male, second one is called female. Male? The male itself has got, normally we understand the male by the person, but there, the two males were combined, you know, like two are combined, I have a head and there is a head on my back, you know, seeing the other side. That is why, in a very nice way, he says, they can go forwards and backwards. That means they will be having eyes for this side and that side, you know. They can roll also, they can spin, they can roll, all that. He says, I have the description, the entire description. You know. There are other things also, Apollo, he got angry, other things I... Um, 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 I, I did say he did some sort of plastic surgery and all that, you know, you know he turns their head so that, you know, because they were cut in the middle, you know, so that is how the navel was stitched. <laughs> and the head was turned to show that gash of the wound so that to remind them of their impunity, you know, their mischief. And then the second question is, yes, sir. you mentioned that uh, particular custom of uh, Greek yes. society was... Pederasty. It was not a pederasty. Pederasty. Is it, is it pedophilia or something uh, other than pedophilia? No. If you say, for example, it is something like pedophilia in the sense, these boys will be very young. They would not even be having beard or uh, only at that point, you know. And these men will be slightly older, older than the boy. So it, 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 the term used in uh, uh, all these uh, books, it is pederasty. It will be there in Oxford Dictionary. Like, like, like pedophilia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like that only. But it was a sanctioned custom in the ancient degree. It was a sanctioned custom. It, it was... It will be shocking for us and it will be a little disgusting also for us. After all, we have a tradition of Guru, Sichi and all where the relationship is sacred and it will not go to physical. But this was not frowned upon. You know? It is very clear. You can read all the scholastic books. You know, what is this ancient custom in Greece? It, it is the ancient custom in Greece. I do not know about Rome, but Greece this is the custom. That's why in all these places you can find, you know, the lover of so and so. Both will be men. Both will be men. But, uh, and in fact, they say the love between man and woman is little less than this love. This love is considered superior. One, the, thought, one thought comes in this. Yes, sir. Uh, in the three genders uh, which uh, the particular uh, uh, Aristophanes. Aristophanes spoke Aristophanes. of. Mm. Now, Probably it has an element of truth. Um, probably we could trace this mysterious, uh, uh, what we call uh, sexual disorientation exactly. of uh, homosexuality. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, that appears to be yes. Same sex marriage. Is a, same sex marriage. Uh, so he is explaining it nicely, you know. <laughs> so it is. It is not something. It, it, it is a very uh, deep. Uh, uh, physiological and uh, uh, and uh, probably evolutionary uh, origins. Possible. Seems like. Pos possible. That's why I said everything has maybe having some element of truth. <laughs> Very first question. Thank you. Interesting and very ennobling talk. 
there, through this dialogue on symposium, I find that it is a, a restatement of the ancient Indian philosophy. In several aspects, uh, I noted this. Um, I'll make uh, one or two remarks on this point. Now, in praise of love, the first view, all abstract quality, there is a presiding deity. That this is fundamental uh, axiom of Indian philosophy. Every there is no faculty in us. There is no uh, activity or phenomena of nature without the presiding spirit. I think that is uh, and it seems to be universal truth, which is which comes out prominently in Platonic philosophy. And then uh, the other point is God of love is the greatest of gods, oldest of gods. This is purely a Rigvedic concept. So I have made a note of that. I'll just read one or two verses from Rigveda on this. So, Rigvedic uh, verses on creation, one or two verses are just read. Then was neither non existence nor existence. There was no realm of air, no sky beyond it. What covered it and where? And what gave shelter? What then? An unfathomable depth of water. Death was not there, nor was there anything immortal. No sign was there. The days and nights divided was not there. No. That one thing, the Rigveda, that absolute reality, that, that nameless, that one thing, breathless, breathed by its own nature, apart from it was nothing whatsoever. And how did the manifestation creation begin? What uh, you know, Aristotle was saying here, that is, darkness there was, at first conceived in darkness, this all was indiscriminate chaos. All that existed then was void and formless. By the great power of warmth was born that one. Thereafter rose desire. Thereafter rose desire in the beginning. Desire is called in Rigveda Kavadeva. Eros in Greek philosophy. But later uh, interpretation of uh, Western scholars, Eros was uh, you know, uh, relegated to a lower desire. But in original uh, uh, conception of Greek philosophy, Eros is Rigvedic Kavadeva the greatest of gods, desire, the primal seed and germ of spirit, sages who searched with their hearts, thought, discovered the kinship of existence and non-existence. So from the non-existence, absolute, the existence which, uh, with which starts the manifestation, Kamadeva was the link. So, uh, very beautiful uh, repetition of the same idea in Platonic philosophy, I just want to share. And then, another example of uh, the, 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 the praise of love, that is wife ready to die to save her husband. It is a repetition of uh, the ancient Indian myth of Savitri and Satyavan. It is the same. Same, same uh, uh, you know, the mythology is uh, narrated in the uh, face of love. And educating youth in virtue was a part of Greek culture. So this is, seems to be the uh, culture of ancient world that is in, in India's Chaturashrama Dharma, the first is Prabhupada, in which the people 
uh, was, edu was educated in the ashram of Gurus. The same thing seems to have uh, persisted in Greece. And then again, doctor's perspective, love is harmony. It is a beautiful concept, harmony of the universe, balancing of the countries, centripetal forces, centripetal forces of countries, and then balancing. Without, without that balancing, there would not be, without balancing the countries, universe cannot, cannot exist at all. Dvandva, the whole universe is pervaded by duality. So Dvandva, that which harmonizes these opposites and brings about harmony, and that is uh, presented as love, a very beautiful concept. And hermaphroditism, hermaphrodite, or androgynous, uh, it is a fact of life. Uh, in fact, the Hindu philosophy teaches that in the beginning, in the evolution of human race, at one time, humanity was a hermaphrodite, male and female combined. That is symbolized in one of the meaning of this is symbolism of Arthur Nani Shura is that there is a reason why in the Hindu gods and goddesses four arms are uh, uh, you know are uh, presented as consisting of four arms. It is a reminder, it is a, a reminder of the uh, stage in the evolution of humanity when he was androgyne and then the separation of sexes take place. And Socrates summarizing of the love and taking it to the uh, final and finale, that is really very great. And it, it looks like to me that uh, the Socratic uh, you know, exposition of love in search of the ultimate. It is in the, it appears to me to be in the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, it is the Shraddha. Shraddha, Bhakti. Love is nothing but Bhakti. Unconditional love, Shraddha. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says that Shraddha, he comes with the Sattva quality. If you remember Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says it comes with the Sattva quality. All human beings are endowed with love. It comes from the Sattva. But there are three kinds of love Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. But here, somebody is speaking of the Sattvic love and the final goal of that. So, uh, and then we can again, uh, you know, uh, relate it to. The four kinds of worshippers of Krishna, those who are afflicted, those who are in search of possessions, and those in search of truth, jiggyasa, and then jnani. That clearly comes out in the dialogue of, uh, uh, the, 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 the presentation of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the object of love by Socrates. Again, ultimate object of love is truth, search of truth. 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, what is the highest object? He says, wisdom itself, the object of wisdom, and that which is to be gained by wisdom. Jnana, Gyayam, Jnana, Gamyam. And where is it? In the heart of all teachers, it presides. And that's precisely what Sukhuti is teaching. So, and what is it? It is truth, good, goodness, and beauty. Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram. A sublime thought and a great presentation by Sri T.K. Jayaraman. We look forward to his uh, next uh, lecture. Probably it's going to be Republic. He's going to be Republic. I was talking to uh, Sri T.K. Jayadama. Uh, I, I was thinking that he was going to uh, give a series of talk on Republic itself. It was so extensive. He said, no, he would not do that, but he would give us an overview of Republic. So my request is that sometime, 
uh, I request uh, the government to give a series of talk to the Republic itself. It contains sublime uh, philosophical content. So with this, I thank you all and I thank Jairam Shri Chige Jairaman on behalf of the Minister of Education. Thank you all very much.